That's a little mortar, that's a little sea, that's a little water in the hearts of the sons and daughters. This kingdom's coming. That's a little stone, that's a little mortar, that's a little sea, that's a little water in the hearts of the sons and daughters. This kingdom's coming. That's a little water in the hearts of the sons and daughters. This kingdom's coming. That's a little stone. That's a little mortar. That's a little seed. That's a little water in the hearts of the sons and daughters. This kingdom's coming. Good morning and welcome to First Christian Church in this virtual space. No matter how you found us, no matter how you come to this worship service, we are a community of faith that believes in God's love and hospitality, so we're glad you're here. A few words about our service and our time together. One is feel free to use the Facebook comment section to say welcome, to comment on prayers, to share prayers. Use that space as you feel comfortable and called. Indeed, later in the service, we will offer prayers, and we'll try to incorporate the prayers that you name in that space. If you don't feel comfortable sharing prayers on Facebook Live, reach out to us later in the week, and we'll make sure to include your prayers in our prayer life. Also, let us know where you're joining us from. It reminds us that we remain connected during this challenging time, and that indeed our community stretches and expands over the miles and distances and unites us in God's love. And a reminder that Nellie is meeting with the children on Zoom this morning. Uh, as we come back in person together, that will remain a hybrid space. If you want more information about our children's and youth ministry, please reach out to us during the week, and we'll get you the relevant information. Again, I remind you to greet one another and interact on Facebook Live as we move deeper into worship. We will also post the lyrics of the songs in that space if you want to sing along in your living room or Living, or, or wherever you're joining us from. Finally, we will break bread at the welcome table later in the service. So now is an opportune time to get your communion elements, whatever they may be. Know that you are welcome in that space and we will break bread together. I re finally, I return to the reminder that this is a community of welcome and God's hospitality. So no matter what brings you to the service, what's happened during the week, know that you are welcome here. Now, let us continue in the spirit of worship by joining together in song.
Blessed be your name in the land that is plentiful, where your streams of abundance flow. Blessed be your name. Blessed be your name when I'm found in the desert place, though I walk through the wilderness. Blessed be We now come to that time in our service in which we share prayers of joy and prayers of concern within our community and even beyond our immediate community. As I said at the beginning of the service, feel free to use Facebook Live to share what's going on in your life. And if you don't feel safe in that space, reach out to us during the week and we'll make sure to incorporate your prayers in our prayer life. I will share a prayer from this community and then say, God, in your mercy. I invite you to respond with the phrase, hear our prayer. And so we begin, as we do every week, by giving thanks for First Christian Church of Burbank and so many communities of faith that remain connected during this challenging time and are reminders of God's love. And so let us give thanks. God, in your mercy. Or also, we have prayers this day for Brian and Nancy Hurst. Brian fell this past week, fracturing his shoulder. They are awaiting news about a possible surgery, but request for prayers for both Brian and Nancy during this time. God, in your mercy. Also, uh, we request prayers for Ken and Nita Trutner. Yesterday morning, as Ken was walking to the church to join us for our monthly hike, he was struck by a vehicle. Ken is okay, but he was quickly taken to the USC Medical Center and was surrounded by the trauma team there. He did suffer a, a head injury and they are keeping him there for observation. He suffered other internal and external injuries as well, all of which the doctors assume at this point Ken will make a full recovery. But Needless to say, yesterday was a stressful day for Nita as she tried to find where Ken was and what had happened. So request for prayers for their entire family at this time. Ken's son, who lives in Canada, is already back and seeking to provide support for his mom and his dad. But prayers are certainly appreciated. Prayers for Ken and Nita. God, in your mercy. 
We also continue to pray for the following individuals who are facing medical uncertainty or questions. We pray for Janine, Pam J, Carlos, Stan, and Britt. God, in your mercy. We also have a request from Liz for prayers for her sister Janet during a medical crisis this past week. God, in your mercy. Britt also requests prayers for her family as her dad's mom is nearing the end of her life. God, in your mercy. We also continue to pray for those in assisted living facilities, particularly those in our own community, for Janet, Paul, and Audrey. God, in your mercy. We also continue to pray for the unhoused and those experiencing homelessness as sweeps across LA County dislocate and cause chaos in so many situations. God, in your mercy. We also continue to pray for students, parents, and teachers during this challenging time as they seek to create safe and creative learning environments. God, in your mercy. We also pray for healthcare workers on the front lines. As COVID numbers decrease drastically in our county and other areas, we know that that is not the case around the world. So we continue to pray during this challenging time of a global pandemic. God, in your mercy. And indeed, we turn our attention to all of creation and all of the world. May all of us continue to embody love find ways to hope, to create peace, and to embrace justice during this time. God, in your mercy, let us continue this time of prayer in song. with her fists out missing the point all her friends were vandals for a peaceful sort of scandal crack a smile so you can handle chapter two it's called the revolution and it's in its final stages all we need now is for everything to come unglued in her dreams she saw god in all never any good at remembering names. Oh, she tried so hard to try so hard to follow. But the silence of prayer was a language she couldn't relay. To let go, she was a petal drifting, helpless to fountain flow. She held a hand softer than her own. She left her calluses behind and moved ahead onto the homestead where family helped her forget that she had a dream, she had a goal, but it just felt so comfortable to stay. Oh, where everybody already knew, I said they already knew she had to say in her dreams she saw God in all the faces and she trembled she was never any good at remembering names oh she tried so hard to try so hard to follow but the silence of prayer was a language couldn't relay. And in her dreams, God's hands would gently lift her just to say, 
This is my daughter with whom I am not always well pleased, but I love her and I love you. Please join me in a time of prayer. God, you're, you whose beauty rests in all things. As we gather and worship this morning, help us to see that beauty and that complexity in the world around us. In this challenging virtual space, help us to welcome one another, to pray for one another, and to be present. So you are aware of all the things we bring to this space, our doubts, our deep questions, our joys, our grief for medical uncertainty, our love for friends near and far. We ask that you hold all of that intention and gather it in under that same beauty and love that you enable us to see each and every day. And as we pray for friends, family, strangers, and indeed all creation. Help us to see that beauty and to be part of that beauty in this world. And we trust that in articulating our prayers, you even hear the things we are unable to say. Grief that is too heavy to articulate, questions that we are unable to answer. We ask that you hear and respond to those as well weaving in our lives reminders of that beauty, peace, and love you so freely offer. Finally, as we end this time of prayer, empower us to be living prayers in this world, living examples of love, patience, kindness, justice, and hope. We offer all of these prayers in the mystery and beauty of your sacred name. Amen. Good morning. Today's scripture reading is from Luke chapter 7, verses 18 to 27. The disciples of John reported all these things to him. So John summoned two of his disciples and sent them to the Lord to ask, are you the one who is to come, or are we to wait for another? When the men had come to him, they said, John the Baptist has sent us to you to ask, are you the one who is to come, or are we to wait for another? Jesus had just then cured many people of diseases, plagues, and evil spirits, and had given sight to many who were blind. And he answered them, go and tell John what you have seen and heard. The blind receive their sight, the lame walk, the lepers are cleansed, the deaf hear, the dead are raised, the poor have good news brought to them. And blessed is anyone who takes no offense at me. When John's messengers had gone, Jesus began to speak to the crowds about John. What did you go out into the wilderness to look at? A reed shaken by the wind? What then did you go out to see? Someone dressed in soft robes? Look, those who put on fine clothing and live in luxury are in royal palaces. What then did you go out to see? A prophet? Yes, I tell you, and more than a prophet. This is the one about whom it is written. See, I am sending my messenger ahead of you who will prepare your way before you. Thanks, Jason. Uh, I'd invite all of us to join together in a time of prayer. God of mystery and grace, open us today to an ancient story and to reminders of the ways in which you move among us. In your name we pray, amen. Have you ever been in a meeting, school, or work situation in which a power play was happening? Not a healthy disagreement, but a kind of power play in which you knew politics was at play and somebody was trying to overpower someone else with words or strategy. Have any of you been in that kind of situation? If you're on Facebook Live, you can raise your hand with an emoji or say, sure, I understand what that's like. I've been in those situations. Well, the truth is the gospel story that Jason just read from Luke 7, 17 through 27, could have easily turned into that kind of power play, that kind of jockeying for power and outdoing the other person. 
what we're placed in the middle of is a very real tension between John the Baptist and Jesus of Nazareth. Two towering figures in first century Palestine. Biblical scholar Fred Craddock will remind us that well into the first century, John the Baptist and later his followers were, were well respected and revered agents of social change and God's transformation. And so as these two pillars of change and God's love from the first century interact with one another, it could have been an easy moment in which power playing and jockeying for, for privilege and power in that community could have taken place. We know those situations. We sit in those meetings in which one person tries to outdo the other. One person tries to be a little more clever than the other not in a healthy discourse, but a way in which one perspective is privileged over the other. And as I said, the story this morning that Jason read could have easily turned into that. But something else happens entirely. And what I believe we begin to witness is a healthy sense of collaboration, relationship building, and God's invitation to be mindful and intentional about our relationships. So what does happen in the story this morning? As it begins, John the Baptist followers witness these things, as Jason read, these things being profound healing and restoration that Jesus is beginning to enact in the community around him. Somebody is raised to life. Somebody is made whole again. Words of incredible power and love are preached. John, the Baptist disciples, begin to witness the power of Jesus' ministry and message in his immediate community. They carry this news with them back to John the Baptist. And John the Baptist asks them to return to Jesus and ask him the question, are you the one? Are you the one that will be the agent of change and transformation in our community? And it's not a snarky question. It's not a dismissive question. But rather we get the sense that it's a genuine question of what's happening? Who are you? A question about the power and ability of Jesus to speak to the lives and realities of those that John the Baptist knew and so many others. And Jesus simply replies, look at what's happening around us. He talks about the healings, the economic uncertainty, the very realities that were being upended and changed, the restoration that was beginning to happen as he moved about the countryside of Galilee. In the words of Thich Nhat Hanh, my actions are my only belongings. Jesus was pointing to the very real circumstances that were happening in the world that John the Baptist and his disciples were a part of. Say, look at my actions. Look at what's occurring. And then he moves through the story, Jesus claiming his own authority and his own actions in that space. And then the verse that's left out that is not included is Jesus then turns and mentions the sheer power and significance of John the Baptist himself. If you get a chance, open to the seventh chapter of Luke and read the entirety of the story, because that's where I believe the teaching comes today, is that instead of Jesus devaluing John the Baptist and his disciples, they rather become collaborators, co-conspirators, in this movement for change in the world. Instead of playing power games with one another, they become partners in the work of God's love in this world. Instead of saying, I'm better at this than you are, instead of minimizing the work of one over the other, they indeed are intentional about the relationship they build and are mindful of the other's actions. What's embedded in this story is an invitation for us and individuals to be mindful 
about the relationships we build in this world. When we work with others, we are invited not to fall in to those games, those power plays, that jockeying for significance over the other, but rather to be partners in transforming and embodying God's love in this world. We are invited to step into the world of John the Baptist and to indeed understand, as Fred Craddock said, that they are pillars in the first century that could have easily, their followers easily could have become combative with one another. But instead, they united in this understanding of God's mission and God's love in this world and thus becoming our invitation as individuals and as a community of faith, to witness and to understand the power of when we come together intentionally listening to one another, hearing one another, not playing power games, but rather sitting in the space of God's love and mystery and honoring each other's gifts, honoring each other's histories, and indeed collaborating with one another to more fully step in to God's call and God's mission for this world. That has significance for us as individuals as we think about the relationships we build in our workplaces, in our volunteer opportunities, and even in our families. Intentionality, mindfulness, honoring each other's gifts is an essential part of that work. And then we move to us as a community of faith and the relationships we build in the wider community. You see, churches easily fall into that trap of playing power games with other nonprofits, of in moments of weakness thinking we somehow are the sole people who have the answers or the perspective that will work. But rather, if we take this story seriously, we see that as a community of faith, we are but one presence in this community. We are called to collaborate and partner with others, honoring other organizations' gifts and perspectives. And as we sit at those tables of societal change and transformation, that we are but one piece of a larger network, not called to jockey for power or assume we have the answer but rather we are part of a larger system that can more fully embody God's love and change if we are mindful, intentional, and thoughtful about the ways in which we build relationships. For decades, the Protestant church in the United States has assumed power and control in too many situations, but we are entering an era and have been in an era in which we are called to partner and collaborate and understand that others are part of this work of social transformation, of, in the words of Jesus, of healing, of bringing restoration to those who are broken. Indeed, we are part of this broader work. And one reminder of that, and I know I brought this up the past couple of weeks, is the work of Week of Compassion. Week of Compassion is the Relief, Development, and Refugee Ministry of the Christian Church, Disciples of Christ. And that ministry stretches back for decades. But it is a ministry that is complicated because of its history. At one time, it was part of the unhealthy practice of Christian colonialism that sought to go into communities around the world and cause disruption rather than partnering and helping those in need, that was beholden to a system that sought to dehumanize rather than humanize. But through the change of the decades, Week of Compassion is one of those prime examples of partnership and collaboration with local communities that seeks to provide relief after a storm, that seeks to work with international communities when people are displaced, not in a top-down hierarchical sense, but rather collaboration and partnership. And one example of that is the work that was done after storms swept through Dayton, Ohio. And so I'm gonna ask our tech team to play a video that tells that story, that when partnership 
listening and intentionality are at work, change can happen. Let's watch this video. My name is Sammy Deacon. I'm the long-term project leader here at our Dayton site. So in 2019, there were 15 tornadoes that hit the Dayton area in one night. And they just kept coming all night long, um, you know, into the same area sometimes over top of each other. In this area, eight huge apartment complexes were wiped out. And that eliminated a lot of housing for a lot of people. Our ministry here is to work with the long-term recovery group They've identified and uh, vetted clients that need help. We help the disabled, the single parent homes, those who have been taken by, by fraudulent uh, contractors, uh, people who are handicapped, that have no other way to recover on their own, and we assist them with that recovery. And it's a blessing to be able to do that. The family that we're currently working with is a large family, and they have not been able to live together in the two years since they had to leave their home after the, the night after the tornado. They had been so taken advantage of by the contractor that they had started to give up hope of ever getting anywhere with their home. And then we were able to come in and, and in three weeks have done more than she said that the contractor had done in months and months and months. And she just broke down in tears of joy. Just, she said, this is my home. I'm gonna be home again. And it was just overwhelming to be able to be a part of that, to get her back in her home. In the third week of them coming in, they have fixed pretty much everything. They fixed stuff that even though was broken, actually. My feelings and my thoughts about it. I mean, I don't, I'm very, very humble. When we're volunteers, we come out for a week or so, and we have to sleep in a, a bed that isn't ours or take a shower in a shower that isn't ours. And we just really want to go home, but that's all they want to. They just want to go home. Being able to be a part of that is awesome. <laughs> so this day, as we find ourselves in the middle of the story of John the Baptist and Jesus, let us be reminded what true relationship, intentionality, and partnership can look like. That they will allow God's love to flourish. They will allow the transformation that is so desperately needed to happen. And we might be able to join with one another, offering that hope, love, and grace in this world. Thank, let us give thanks this day for the witness of John the Baptist and Jesus, and our ability to move in and out of that space of true relationship and collaboration. Thanks be to God. Amen. As we gather now to share communion, we do it at the invitation of Jesus. He extends that invitation to all who believe. We as a congregation of the Christian Church Disciples of Christ require no other criteria. This table is open to all. In the same manner, just as Jesus used whatever food and beverage he had at hand to celebrate that first communion, we do the same. So since we're all at home right now, at least until next week, and as we have done for the past several months, take whatever bread or baked goods or whatever you happen to use and share it when we break the bread together. Likewise, take whatever beverage you have. And when we take the cup following saying the Lord's Prayer in unison, we know that the communion sacrament is in the act, not in the materials. When we take communion, we believe that we share that communion with all Christians throughout the world. That's a powerful message and a powerful connection with the world around us. 
It's not very often that baptism makes the national headlines and news stories that go into a beta of, or a bit of deep background to explain what baptism is and its significance to Christians. But that's what happened this past week. A priest in Arizona was determined to have baptized some tens of thousands of folks during his years in the priesthood, but unfortunately had used language that hadn't been approved by his church, thereby jeopardizing the validity in the church's eyes of all of those people's baptisms. This made me very sad for all those folks whose lives had been affected, and also for the priest who had nothing but good intentions and was just bringing folks to Christ. It got me to thinking about my own baptism and how I might feel in a similar situation if that had happened to me. I was baptized as a young person right here in this church on Palm Sunday, either as a fifth or sixth grader, as I recall, I can't remember which, following a membership and faith development class with a bunch of my friends. I think there were six of us that were baptized on that particular Sunday. And we were baptized in that baptistry that's at the front of the chancel right there behind the communion table. I remember how I felt when I made my confession of faith at the conclusion of that class and how light I felt as I came up from the water of my baptism. I think I recognized that the minister had physically performed the baptism, but to me, the act of immersion and rising up was between me and Jesus. I remember coming out after the baptism and joining with the rest of the congregation to participate in my first communion and as a member of the body of Christ. I can't help but think that many of those whose baptisms may be in question probably had the same experience and the same spiritual awakening that I did. To me, it is the belief of the believers that validates those baptisms and not whether or not the correct word was spoken as part of the ritual. That same feeling of lightness comes upon me when I am witness to the baptism of another or the confession of faith from a person as they join the body of Christ. I've had this experience sitting here in our own sanctuary and when attending other churches as visitor, and it's always the same no matter where I am, but that's only part of the story. I've had this experience as a youth at church camp when fellow campers and later on as fellow counselors have been baptized or given their confession of faith. I've been witness to baptisms in camp swimming pools and lakes and witnessed faith statements at campfires, at camp staff meetings, at even at denominational assemblies with thousands of people in attendance and also at simple backyard gatherings. I can guarantee you that the language used at each one of those different events was not scripted or doctrinal, but rather it was spoken from and received by the heart. Those camp baptisms are as meaningful, as purposeful as any that are held in a formal sanctuary in a tiled baptistry and perhaps even more so. We as Christ Church, operating as a congregation of the Christian Church Disciples of Christ, recognize all of these as acts of that sacrament of baptism. In many ways, they speak to the personal manner in which faith grows and the different ways that folks establish their relationship with God. I look around and see all the folks who are part of our fellowship here at Burbank First, and I know that everyone has their own story, their own faith journey, their own baptism story, and their own relationship with Christ. I have to say that I don't know many of those stories, but I know that they're there and they reassure me. That's why when I thought about all those thousands of folks baptized by this priest whose baptisms were doctrinally suspect, I know from my own experience that they're okay, that God knows what was in their heart and that Jesus was with them at the time of their baptism regardless of any words that were spoken. They have a place in the fellowship of the church and they have a place at the universal communion table. As much as those kids from summer camp, those whose spiritual awakening might have come at an AA meeting and those who made their confession at an in-home Bible study. At This table, everyone is welcome. It's a reminder that indeed, whatever you bring to this meal, whatever communion elements you have in your home, they are welcome here. In a few moments, I will break the bread and lift up the cup. We will then take our bread together. Jason will lead us in the Lord's Prayer. We will then take the cup together. So let us be reminded that on that night, Jesus was gathered with his closest friends and after offering a prayer, took bread and broke it, saying, this is my body 
broken for you. Do this in remembrance of me. In a similar way, he took a cup and after giving thanks, poured it out, saying, this is the cup of the new covenant given for you and for all. Each time you do this, do this in remembrance of me. Let us take the bread together. We use many words to name God, including Yahweh, Creator, Father, Mother, Adonai, and Sustainer. Whether you are in your living room watching Facebook Live or in the sanctuary, please use, please use the name of God and phrases in, your, in the Lord's Prayer that challenge, comfort, and sustain your prayer life. So please join me in prayer. Our Creator, who art in heaven, hallowed be thy name. Thy kingdom come, thy will be done on earth as it is in heaven. Give us this day our daily bread and forgive us our sins as we forgive those who sin against us. Do not let us fall into temptation, but deliver us from evil. For thine is the kingdom and the power and glory forever. Amen. You may drink the cup. So, I uh, hope you guys enjoyed our service. Um, a lot of this isn't uh, a lot of this is made possible through volunteership as well as financial donations. If you are interested in donating, uh, my camera's off. Well, some technical difficulties. any better you're there <laughs> yeah sure yeah sorry, sorry about that uh so if you're interested in donating uh financially you guys can uh go to our fcburbank.org website we have a give now button that will send you the open type or you can also do the same thing through our facebook group we also have a donate button there uh there's also the classic uh, mail in the check that you can also do, and you can find our address on fccburbank.org as well. And if you're interested in volunteering your time, there's several events that Brandon will uh, let you guys know about. Thanks, Jason. Um, yes, uh, we have several opportunities to be in community with one another, whether that's through study or volunteer opportunities. This week, we resume our, um, we continue our weekly opportunities, Wednesday night study at 7 p.m. Homemade Thursdays utilizes our kitchen every Thursday to prepare and then deliver meals to those living in the encampments. And then Thursday evening, we have a weekly reflection group. Not too far around the corner is our BTAC lunch packing program. All of that information is in our weekly email that goes out on Tuesdays. If you don't receive that email, reach out to us and make sure we have your email address included. There are a number of leaders in our congregation that make sure these things happen, so we'll make sure you get connected with the appropriate person. Also, a reminder that Nellie meets with our kids virtually every week. If you want information about that, please reach out to us. Finally, an announcement that I made last week, but we'll repeat this week. Next week, for those who feel safe and are interested, we are returning to in-person worship in the sanctuary, so you are more than welcome to come here with a mask. But um, feel free to join us in the sanctuary. Our virtual worship space will continue. This is a hybrid model. This is worship going forward. Um, so know that wherever you are around the world, you can still join us. And for those in the area who want to join us in person, you're welcome here. And then after worship next week, we will have a celebration in the parking lot that will include food, decorations, and music. Uh, before we embark on the journey of Lent, this is a way to celebrate. A homemade Thursdays will pre be preparing the meal, and trust me, it is going to be good food. You can hear more about that ministry and that opportunity. And we will be joining in the parking lot in that celebration with Seguil Christian Church. So if you're in the area, join us in the parking lot. It will begin at 1215 next Sunday. Now, with all that's going on in our community, I'm going to ask our musicians to lead us in the closing song. Thank you, Brandon. Please join us as you're comfortable and wherever you are in singing our closing song. Isaiah song.
Brothers and sisters, go out into the world in peace. Have courage. Hold on to what is good. Return no one evil for evil. Strengthen the faint-hearted. Support the weak. Help the suffering. Honor all persons. Love and serve the Lord, rejoicing in the power of the Holy Spirit. And may the love of God, the light of Christ, and the power and communion of that Spirit be with each and every one of us. Let us go in peace. Amen. <laughs>